This is Land of Havila, Genesis 37c. At the end of the last episode, Jacob sent Joseph to check on his brothers in Shechem. It was about a 50-mile trip from their home in the valley of Hebron. In verse 15 of Genesis 37, Joseph arrived in Shechem, but he couldn't find his brothers. From Joseph's point of view, they were lost. Flashing forward, when Jesus came, the Israelites were lost. Jesus said he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24. In verses 17 and 18, Joseph was diligent to keep looking until he found his brothers. Flashing forward, Jesus said he would look for even one sheep that's lost until he finds it, Luke 15, 4. In verse 18, Joseph's brothers saw him coming a long way off. Before Joseph got near, they conspired to kill him. Flashing forward very early in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verse 6, when Jesus was in Galilee, early in his ministry, a long time before the crucifixion, quote, the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him, Mark 3, 6. Just as it was in Joseph's generation, the Israelites had their antennas up, saw Jesus a long way off, and conspired to kill him. In verse 19, as Joseph was approaching, the brothers sarcastically called him the dreamer. Flashing forward, speaking of Jesus, quote, even his own brothers didn't believe in him, John 7, 5. Joseph's brothers didn't believe he was anything, and Jesus' brothers didn't believe he was anything. In verse 20, Joseph's brothers called him the dreamer. They assumed that if they killed Joseph, that would be the end of his offensive dreams. There'd be no way that Joseph could claim authority over them. Flashing forward to John 11:50, Caiaphas the high priest assumed that if they killed Jesus, that would be the end of him. There'd be no way Jesus could exercise authority over them. In verses 21 and 22, Reuben wanted to save Joseph's life, but he was afraid of his brothers. He should have put his foot down and said, I'm not going to allow Joseph to be mistreated whatsoever. He had the authority to say it. He was the oldest, but he was weak. So Reuben suggested an evil alternative that they put Joseph in the pit. He intended to come back later and release Joseph, but it didn't go as planned. He lost Joseph completely. Flashing forward, Pilate wanted to save Jesus' life, but he was afraid of the Israelites. He had the authority. He was the highest authority around. He should have put his foot down and said, I'm not going to allow Jesus to be mistreated whatsoever, because he knew Jesus was innocent. But Pilate was weak. In his weakness and lack of resolve, lack of resolve, he proposed an evil alternative that Jesus should be whipped. So instead of don't kill him, just throw him in the pit and leave him to die, it was don't kill him, let's just whip him. Pilate was intending to release Jesus afterward, but it didn't go as planned. He wound up losing Jesus completely. That was about 10 specifics, but as far as the 50 points of prophecy are concerned, we only counted all of that as just one point. In verse 23, Joseph's brothers stripped his coat when they were doing away with him. Flashing forward, the soldiers at the cross stripped Jesus' coat when they were doing away with him, John 19, 23. In verse 24, Joseph's brothers cast him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it, it says. Flashing forward, they put Jesus in a new tomb cut in stone where no person had ever been laid, Luke 23, 53. It was empty, like Joseph's pit. There was no water in the pit, otherwise Joseph could have drowned. It would have prevented Joseph from coming out alive. And in Jesus' tomb, there was nothing in that, no power in heaven or earth that could keep Jesus from coming out alive. In verse 25, Joseph's brothers sat down to eat immediately after they put him in the pit. This seemingly insignificant detail is a prophecy. They sat down to eat. Flashing forward, what did the house of Israel do? Immediately after they put Jesus in the tomb, they sat down to eat. Here's why we know that. Remember that when they crucified Jesus, he died in the afternoon and they had to rush to get his body in the tomb because the Sabbath would be starting at sundown, John 19:42. So they were racing the clock. They got Jesus in the tomb just before sunset. Also, it's key to remember that Jesus was crucified on Passover which tells us that the Passover meal was to be observed just after sunset, which is according to the Passover law of Hebrews 12.18, or Exodus 12.18. We know they ate the Passover that night because when the Jews delivered Jesus to Pilate the morning of the day of crucifixion, they weren't willing to enter the praetorium because Pilate was a Gentile, and to enter a Gentile's home 
that be unclean to eat the Passover that evening, John 18, 28. So no doubt they got Jesus in the tomb just before sunset and ate the Passover just after sunset. In other words, they sat down to eat, just as it says in Genesis 37, 25. Flashing back to a little later in Genesis, after some time went by, Joseph's brothers repented. They remembered how Joseph cried out in distress when he was left for the pit, left in the pit for dead, but they kept eating and paid no attention. It didn't spoil their appetites. They were callous. They said, we're certainly guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we wouldn't listen. Genesis 42:21. So Joseph was distressed and begging, but they ate. In the same way, the Israelites of Jesus' generation were callous as they were eating the Passover of all things, having just whipped Jesus, nailed him to the cross, and put him in the tomb. It didn't spoil their appetites for the Passover. So in both cases, they did away with them, and immediately they sat down to eat. Again, that was about 10 specifics, but I counted them as one point as far as the 50 points of prophecy are concerned. Still in verse 25, the brothers saw a caravan of Ishmaelites with camels carrying a load of spicery balm and myrrh. The brothers called them over to the pit. Flashing forward, what did Nicodemus bring to Jesus' tomb? Quote, a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred Roman pounds, John 19, 39. A hundred pounds is a load. So in Genesis and in the Gospels, how coincidental is this? Someone brought a load of spices and myrrh to the pit in Joseph's case and the tomb in Jesus' case. The spicery came on animals in both cases. The animal wasn't mentioned in Jesus' time, but the weight of the load was given, being so heavy it almost had to be on an animal, just like it was with Joseph. In verse 26, Judah asked, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Therefore, they lifted Joseph from the pit and got some money for him. This is the question that you and I must ask, must ask for ourselves. Now that Jesus has been put in the tomb, what profit would it be for you and me if Jesus had stayed there, dead? It only profits us if he gets lifted from the tomb, right? If there's no resurrection and Jesus doesn't come up from the grave to rule and reign, to be our brother and Savior and Lord, what profit would there be for us? So let's profit from Jesus' lifting. Let's profit from his blood. What profit is it if he's slain and we conceal his blood? In verses 26 through 28, the brothers sold Jesus, sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Flashing forward, Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. What are the chances? In verses 26 and 27, Joseph's brothers said, let not our hand be on him. They decided they didn't want any blood on their hands. Flashing forward, Pilate didn't want any blood on his hands. He washed his hands of the blood of Jesus, Matthew 27, 24. In verse 28, Joseph's brothers lifted him out of the pit where Joseph had been left for dead. Flashing forward, God lifted Jesus from the tomb where he had been left for dead, Acts 3, 15. Jesus rose from the tomb, in other words. Joseph's rising from the pit was a prophecy of the resurrection from the tomb, it's extremely unlikely that anyone would ever rise from the dead, but since there's a God powerful enough to make the rest of Genesis 37 happen, why couldn't he make the resurrection happen? Flashing back to Genesis, Joseph's pit started empty and ended empty. Flashing forward, Jesus' tomb started empty and ended empty, Matthew 28, 6. In verse 28, the Ishmaelites brought Joseph into Egypt where we know in coming chapters they again put Joseph in a pit, a dungeon, it says. When Pharaoh raised him from the dungeon, he glorified Joseph immediately. Joseph was at Pharaoh's right hand, so to speak. Such was his power, as equal to Pharaoh as he could be. Pharaoh gave Joseph all glory and honor. After that, whenever anyone wanted anything from Pharaoh, Pharaoh had only one answer for them, quote, Go to Joseph, what he says to you, do. Genesis 41, 55. Joseph became the only source of the bread of life for the world. Genesis chapter 41. When Joseph's brothers eventually began to starve in Canaan, they came to Joseph. There was nowhere else for them to go for food. Joseph recognized them, but they didn't recognize him because Joseph was high and lifted up. He was ruler of Egypt. He was speaking through a translator. 
Joseph gave them food and kept them alive, but he didn't accept them or reveal himself to them. He didn't trust them, obviously. The brothers went back to Canaan and eked it out some more, but eventually they had to come back to Joseph for more grain. This time they repented in front of Joseph in their own language, not knowing that Joseph could understand them and still not knowing it was Joseph. Hearing that his brothers were repenting, Joseph immediately revealed himself to them and accepted them with joy and tears. He brought them and the entire family to Egypt and took care of them. Egypt was a paradise compared to Canaan. Joseph said, don't worry about anything, just come to my kingdom and I'll take care of you. Flashing forward, every bit of that applies to Jesus. The night before the crucifixion, Jesus said the Father would, quote, glorify him immediately, John, 10, John 13, 32, just like Pharaoh glorified Joseph immediately coming out of the dungeon. Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, Mark 16, 10, as Joseph ascended to the right hand of Pharaoh. The Father gave Jesus all glory, honor, and power, Revelation 4, 11, as Pharaoh gave to Joseph. Whenever anyone wants anything from God, God has one answer. He points to Christ, John 15, 16, as Pharaoh pointed to Joseph. Mary said of Jesus, quote, what he says to you do, John 2, 5, word for word what Pharaoh said about Joseph. When we begin to starve spiritually, to be spiritually hungry, we must go to Jesus. There's nowhere else to go for spiritual food. Jesus is the bread of life for the world, John 6, 35, just as Joseph was the world's only source of bread. We won't know Jesus, and he won't accept us until we repent, Luke 13, 3, just like the brothers didn't know Joseph until they repented. Jesus brings the repentant to paradise, Luke 23, 43. He says, don't worry about anything, just seek my kingdom, and I'll take care of everything else, Matthew 6, 33. Just like Joseph brought his brothers to the paradise of Egypt and said, don't worry about anything, I'll take care of you. Do we think God knew what he was talking about in Genesis? Back in Genesis 37, verse 29, Reuben returned to the pit and Joseph wasn't there. Flashing forward on resurrection morning, the women of Galilee returned to the tomb, and Jesus wasn't there, Luke 24, 3. In verses 29 and 30, Reuben suddenly grew a conscience and was overcome with remorse. He went back to his brothers, panicking and despairing for his own life, but it was too late. He said, I, whither shall I go? Knowing he had nowhere to go. Flashing forward after Judas betrayed Jesus, Judas suddenly grew a conscience and was overcome with remorse. He went back to the chief priests and elders, panicking and despairing for his life, but it was too late, Matthew 27, 3 through 5. Judas, knowing he had nowhere to go, killed himself. Again, that was several specifics, but I counted them as one point. In verses 31 through 33, Joseph's brothers killed a goat, used some of the blood on the coat, and showed the coat to their father. Jacob looked at the coat and concluded that an evil animal had devoured Joseph. So we see how the brothers were able to shift the blame from themselves to the evil animal using the blood. The blood covered their sin. It got them off the hook. They knew when they presented the bloody coat that their father wouldn't blame them. And that's the way it turned out. It didn't, it didn't enter Jacob's mind that he should blame the brothers. Flashing forward, Satan is an evil animal, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8, like the evil animal that supposedly devoured Joseph. When we come into the Heavenly Father's presence and draw his attention to the blood, it shifts the blame from us to the evil animal Satan. The blood covers our sin like the blood covered the brother's sin. It shifts the blame away from us. It doesn't enter God the Father's mind that he should hold us responsible like it didn't enter Jacob's mind. In verses 32 and 33, when Joseph's brothers asked the father, is this your son's coat? Jacob made a positive ID of whose son it was. He said, it is my son's coat, and it sobered him up. Flashing forward to the cross, the centurion made a positive ID of whose son it was. He said, quote, truly this was the son of God, Matthew 27, 54, and it sobered him up. In verses 34 and 35, when Jacob learned that Joseph was dead, it was an earthquake in his life. He refused to be comforted. Darkness settled in night and day. 
Flashing forward, when God observed Jesus dying on the cross, it was a dark time in heaven. God reproduced the heavenly darkness, the darkness he was feeling. He reproduced it on earth for three hours in the middle of the day while Jesus was hanging on the cross. Jacob's darkness was a foreshadowing of the darkness of God. The moment Jesus breathed his last, God the Father experienced an emotional earthquake. We know that because God reproduced that earthquake physically on earth at the moment of death. The earth quaked, Matthew 27, 51. That was the end of the chapter, but there's more. We know Jesus just by his first name, but he was known more fully back in Nazareth as Jesus, son of Joseph, John 6, 42. Going back another generation, Joseph was the son of Jacob, Matthew 1, 16. In other words, Jesus' grandfather was named Jacob. Jesus was Jesus, son of Joseph, son of Jacob. This is God giving us a New Testament confirmation that we're right on the money linking Jesus to the Joseph and Jacob of Genesis. That should be enough, but there's more. Jesus didn't own his own tomb. He borrowed it. From whom did he borrow it? It belonged to Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. Matthew 27, 60. They put Jesus in Joseph's tomb. Or we could call it Joseph's pit, legitimately, since Jesus' tomb was cut from the rock of the earth. Matthew 15, 46. What a mighty God we serve. To summarize, Jesus is in Genesis. Genesis predicted it all, including the resurrection. Nobody but God could perform a resurrection, much less predict one. This could only happen if God is God, if Jesus is who he said he was, and the Bible is amazingly accurate. God called umpteen impossible shots and made them. He called them in sequence, 1900 years in advance, before he even broke the table, before any of the balls were set up. It was all in one small section of Genesis, and there's so much more in other passages of the Old Testament spoken by the prophets at various times in various ways, Hebrews 1.1, prophecies that were unclear ahead of time, but now they're clear in retrospect. We should believe the evidence is there. As the old hymn says, what more can he say than to you he has said? We can have no more doubt. If some unbelieving thought passes through our mind, we can banish it immediately by remembering Genesis 37. The complete story of Genesis 37 as just told can be found all in one file at landofhavilah.net under the title Proof. Genesis 38 is next at landofhavilah.net. Genesis 38.